Hey everyone, thanks for joining us. Thanks for saying hi back. <laughs> um, so I'm Maddie, I'm uh, part of the team at Culture Hub and um, our team is here also up in the booth because we are also live streaming this event. So the cameras that you see behind you, you can also say hi to that audience. Nice, good job saying hi. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for coming, first of all. Okay, first business, fire exit is that way, where you came. There's also, in the event of us needing it, an exit right behind that, um, that curtain, that mysterious curtain. Um, I think photos are okay during this event. Yeah, So, and if you wanna post things on the internet, you can tag us as well. Um, Culture Hub is a global art and technology community founded by Seoul Institute of the Arts in Korea and La Mama Experimental Theater Club, where we are now in New York. Um, and we've been around for about 13, 14 years, um, and we explore the internet and um, emerging technologies, especially in the context of liveness, uh, performance, and storytelling. Um, this is our first event in this beautifully newly renovated building, which was La Mama's first permanent home um, in the East Village. Uh, La Mama was founded in 1961, so it's exciting to be breathing new life into this building with all of you here. Um, this event is part of Experiments in Digital Storytelling, which is a program that we have between La Mama and Culture Hub, and the next three weeks are gonna be a series of experimentations, lab-oriented sort of um, explorations of, of digital storytelling. This building is um, very data networked and is built for sort of breaking past the four walls of the theater. Um, so in that spirit, we are live streaming and we have a couple of readers who are gonna be joining us remotely. Um, we're super excited to have Max, who is one of the publishers. Um, for the HTML review. I know that I think Shelby, who's the, is, is, is in the chat. So if you're in the chat on the, on the web, you can comment and we will be happy to feel your presence here. Um, and yeah, bathrooms are on the fourth floor, which you can get to by stairs or elevator. There's also bathrooms on the first floor. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Max. Thank you. Hey, everybody. So I can't believe we're here. Um, I can't believe this project exists. I'm so grateful to all the contributors and also all, all of you for coming. It's just like a dream come true. And we're so grateful to La Mama and Culture Hub for, for hosting us here. Culture Hub was the first place I ever had any sort of artist residency. Um, so I highly recommend all of their, their stuff. Um, we have a stacks lineup tonight. So... People are going to go really fast, and I'm just going to like really quickly introduce people, and we're just going to fly through it. Um, so first up, we have an incredible poet and author who had a piece that was part of our first issue. Um, she wrote the amazing collection, Fighting is Like a Wife. Here is Eloisa Amazkua. I'm cheating and I'm not gonna read, so you can just watch. Uh, the only thing you need to know is that um, the, there's a little violence in the video and um, all of the language are repurposed lines spoken by Bobby Chacon, who is the protagonist of the collection. We're love. Good game of catch. Going to. We love to get out. hit. We're going to We're play love. a good love game play. of catch. Going we to. We love to hit back. A we. We got two fighters game. who love fight. to fight. Fighters love a game to, to play. play. To play, play. We, we fight, fight who we love. Love. We fight.
Thank you. Woo, thanks, Eloisa. All right. Do we do we got any word hack fans in the in the audience? Um, the HTML review would definitely not exist if if uh, our next reader um, hasn't been doing all the work um, they've been doing for for many years. So, um, give it up for the one, the only Todd Anderson. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Todd. Uh, uh, big thanks to to Max and and Shelby for creating a publication where where work like mine makes sense. It's it's really really nice to be part of that. Uh, so uh, I got uh, a piece here. It's called uh, a small memorial, uh, and you can actually participate if you'd like. You you, you don't have to, but you can on your phone. Uh, the website is a hyphen small hyphen memorial dot glitch dot me. Uh, we can maybe swap that in here. Just do a little a little editing. Oh no, you're gonna let's pop in here. So, yeah, let's just get a oh, yeah, that's not good. That's not how we do it. Yeah, there we go. Computers. They're just like us. Um <laughs> Okay, uh, here. so this is a website you can go to on your phone. It's going to ask you to, to do something. So we got this number, and uh, this is also, I, I guess, a mild content warning. It's a memorial piece for, for a pet, just so you are aware. Uh, and uh, I wanted to create something that actually just asked a small thing of the visitors. So what I'm going to ask of you is if you're on your phone, there's going to be two buttons on the bottom of your screen. If you're on your keyboard, there's two keys. Uh, the grave accent on the upper left uh, under the escape key, it's a little like that, the, it's like the tilde, and then the backspace, two keys that are kind of far, far apart. You can kind of like stretch out, stretch your arms out, and then press down those buttons. And once, uh, as, if we look at that thing in the upper left, that's going to convey to you that two out of t 23 people uh, so I, I should have, uh, uh, it's possible the piece won't run at all because if a lot of you are visiting and not participating, uh, that's definitely an option. Uh, this is a, a poem that can fail. Uh, and uh, wow, yeah, a lot of, a lot, a lot of if, you're, uh, if you're not interested in holding down these buttons, uh, you can also uh, maybe do the performance a favor by leaving the website. Um, uh, yeah, so if you have it open, there's buttons at the bottom. You can, you can, can press them. We're, we're, we're cruising around three, which is really uh, not great. I am like, man, if I was on my laptop, I'd just like pop open, edit the source code. Maybe, I, maybe, ah, oh, man, could get a, get a spam bot in here. Uh, and maybe uh, if some of you could be a, a, a good. Um, yeah, I mean, I just have, I'd have to log in uh, to change the the source code, or I could spin up its own instance. Really, regret inviting you to join this piece at this point. <laughs> uh, uh, it is cool that it is participatory, but uh, I, now, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe I'll go in five minutes. I've give you some time to think about what you've done. <laughs> All right, Todd will be back. Um, um, that, yeah. This is what happens when it's your first reading. Um, next up, we have um, coming to us, I, I believe, from, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, Boston, Massachusetts, um, uh, an incredible researcher and artist and writer. Um, if I can figure out how to get there. Uh oh, nope, not Alex. There we go. Uh oh, it's not letting me switch the desktop tech. If uh... it's not. 
All right, give us one sec. Ta-da! Alicia Guo! Hello, everyone. Um, I'll be reading two poems. Let me share a screen. And hope this works as well. Great. Um, so this is a series of different six different ways on how to find a poem. And let's see. I love to be found under ferociously speaking do you we are something delirious effervescent when you are perfectly ceremoniously unjust at the wandering near screaming clouds but yes tell me a story and so this is one of them uh, this is what happens if the poems you find follow you around. And the next one is how to find one in the dark. And this is what I get for including um, chants in my poems. It's very nerve wracking to read on the fly, but here we go. It seems slippery hands on inner alchemy of earthy paused enchantment on a trip waiting and waiting greedily innocently speaking threads of but yes I love cheerfully, perfectly, from innocently. Isn't it lovely to find around seashells? wondering laughter on paused from alchemy of wondering wondering to find alchemy of enchantment perfectly alchemy of isn't it lovely Perfect Thank you. Mind. Earthy on from laughter. All right. All right. Oh. Just really want to go back to Zoom, huh? Thank you. Uh, you good to go, Todd? Yeah. Should we give it another shot? All right, give it up again for Todd Anderson. Okay, okay. By popular demand, there is a new easy setting. Uh, I, I, I see people joining, and that might be a mistake. Uh, but uh, don't join on an iPhone. Uh, but so now, now I've sent said it. So I, I don't have one, so I can't test. Okay, so if we have at least one fifth of the people in the room. <laughs> Uh, then it'll work, and I think it's working. Let's do it. Okay, just sit there with your arms spread out wide. And breathe. The 
There's this Jet Li movie from 2006. It's called Fearless. It's his last big martial arts movie. The fights are great, but they're not what sticks with me. What sticks with me is this one scene in the middle, where Jet Li is recovering from a fight in this rural farming village. And when he's trying to help out in the rice fields, he's always racing everyone, trying to plant rice the fastest. Sometimes there's a small breeze, and all the villagers stop what they're doing, and spread their arms wide, look at the sun, smile, and breathe. First, Jet Li doesn't get it. While everyone else is smiling and breathing, Jet Li races to plant more rice, like a child. He is planting rice all over. Just trying to be fastest. What an idiot. What a fool. He wakes up early the next morning and sees the nice lady from the village painstakingly repainting, planting all his terrible work from the day before. And he's humbled. And he decides to become better. So the next time we see him out there planting, and the wind blows, I used to have a pet frog named Frogo. He died a few weeks ago. One of Frogo's favorite activities was burbling. just hanging in place with limbs outstretched as if suspended in midair. Sometimes for hours. just existing at a point in space and time. Frogo was an expert at just being in the world. He reminds us that we don't need to rush, don't need to race. We can just be. So I thought it would be nice if in his memory we could all just spend a moment hanging in place, existing.
miss you, buddy. Thanks. You can let go now. Thanks, everyone. I love that piece so much. Thanks, Todd. Next up, we have um, the one HTML review contributor who has work in the Whitney and the Met. Um, the one, the only, the great Betsy Kenyon. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm so happy to be here, and I'm so happy that Max and Shelby created this. It's so wonderful. Um, and I also, my collaborator for this project, Belle Krupchak, is not here, but I couldn't make this without her. Um, so anyway. Attention. Severe leading storms close to us. Seek shelter here. The space was immense. The ground was soft, wetness permeating my clothing, dampening my skin. I tried to focus my attention to better understand where I was and what was around me. Everything grew more alive, louder. I was breaking apart, every bit expanding, swelling and separating. From a distance, the voices seemed to be in unison, the sound of confusion and speed. There was no way to make sense of the information. Confusion replaced with stillness. I could smell earth, feel myself becoming earth, my limbs melting as I lay there, unable to move. Thank you. Thanks, Betsy. All right, next up we have coming in to us live believe. Chia Amasola. I mean, that's Alicia, but. Hi, everyone. I'm going to fill out a form. Please complete, sign, and submit this form. Are you human? What did you want to be called? I wanted to be something, so I retrieved the form of myself until I had become all clear. I wanted to know myself through what was left in other people. I wanted my series of relations. The problem with this remembering is that all I am will be in what was of me. Before I spoke, they wrote my God in birthplace. Then I was deemed to be worthy of watching. I wanted to be known. I wanted to be known. I wanted to be known. I am known. I am known. I am known. I am known. Before you ask me what I wish I had been asked, I am known. What is your name? What is your occupation? What is your gender? What is your mother's maiden name? 
What was the name of the street you grew up on? Where did you meet your spouse? How old were you? What did you want to be asked? I know you, so let me ask you. You and me do love love. I'm wondering if this is the way to make myself real. You ask me, I ask myself, and there is some understanding. I've gotten what I wanted, I have what I want. Could you believe in the legitimacy of a person, object, event, memory? There was no record of it. What time is it? What is this life but an exercise in asking? What is my knowing if not the rearticulation of what already of what was already there? To put it simply, I'm putting us to record. Come love the simplicity of choice. Every way to explain ourselves must. Asking this to be known, baking soda in the sink, place of address, how long do I have to stay? Everything was answered, everything was unanswered. A history of surrender. Have you ever held hands romantically? Have you ever been on a date, been in a relationship? Dance without leaving room for Jesus? Nothing, all, where, wanting, knowing, seeking, dreaming, hating, loving, everything was answered. What year was your father born? When did he come? What was your first job? How much did you earn? How long? What other names were you called? What name did you take for yourself? What I had done, what I read, when I am. What is this name but for constant address? And we waited. Some have a background, identity, or talent so meaningful, we strongly encourage applicants representing a range of differences that include but are not limited to age, national origin, ethnicity, race, religion, ability, sexual orientation, gender. Please upload a photo of yourself as a child. Please upload a photo that you took today. Please continue waiting. The problem of this remembering is all that I am, will be, and what was asked of me. Before I spoke, they wrote, I was asked, I must have been made, give me a name. I took a name no one else wanted to keep. I took the address that was addressed to me and only ever thought of taking someone else's. We scratched new murals on our own sun and raised all children in no new ways. I decided to respond to nothing but touch. You and me do love love. Thank you. All right. Um this guy. I'm realizing now at the beginning I didn't do this, so I'm going to do it now. Um, in case you're wondering and you don't know what this is right here, this is the first reading of the HTML review, <laughs> which is a literary magazine that publishes all work that's sort of meant for the web, that's sort of intended for the web as a medium. And um, since this is our first reading, we're sort of figuring out, like, what does it mean to then read that work? but all of this work can also be experienced online, which is a whole other thing at the html.review. Next up, we have uh, a lovely, lovely friend of mine, Larissa Pham. Oh, do you need it? Or are you just um, gonna I'm going to use my browser, yeah. Um, 
Max, I'm going to present something slightly different than what I told you I was going to present. But um, so I have, ooh, do I need to, maybe, mm? I can't see myself typing. This is interesting. What should I do? <laughs> the keyboard is not um, connected somehow. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I work on this really intermittently, this project called Poem Club, where I basically do things that the HTML review does, but um, just on my own GitHub. Um, and my, my submission for the first issue is a little maudlin, so I didn't want to read it tonight. And I was like, Max, can I show something else? Um, so I'm going to read you a poem that is kind of seasonal. Yay, let's hope this works. Okay, um, so, um, oh, question. How do I adjust the, vol the volume on this? Because there is, okay. Um, if it's too loud, how would I? Okay, great. Um, so this piece is called Emotional Music Plays, and it's inspired by anime and subtitles and phone calls. Yeah, I don't know. I've been going through some stuff lately. No, nothing bad, just, you know, sometimes you just want everything to slow down, but it doesn't. When it's spring and the cherries are in bloom, it always makes me so nostalgic. It's like a thousand memories are packed into each flower. Spring is such a short season, so the memories feel extra sharp. Does that make sense? Haha. <laughs> the trees always bloom all at once, almost. You're going about your days, and then all of a sudden, flowers everywhere, an explosion. This time of year, I get worried I'll never have enough time. It's no use worrying about time. That's Frank O'Hara, animals. It's like everything I do, I have to do while the cherries bloom. And I get so worried, trying to grab all this joy right out of the air. And I worry that if I don't get it now, I'll never get it. When I'm happy, I want to keep it with me forever, you know? I know that's not how it works. It just feels like it sometimes, like I'll lose it. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're right. It's true that joy comes when you don't expect it. You can trust that, if you can trust anything. Yeah. Yeah, I am happy. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Love you, too. That's all. Thank you. Every Everyone go buy Larissa's book, Pop Song. It's really good. Um, next up, uh, we have uh, a piece that... Um, uh, what people often ask about the challenges of archiving work like this, and it's a problem. And um, Logan Williams is going to tell us about a piece which um, literally could stop working at any moment. Um, so here's, here's Logan. Hi, 
My name is Logan, and I'd like to read from my piece for the HTML review, Observatory. Observatory is a real-time, exquisite corpse poetry generator that finds, somewhat voyeuristically, the thoughts and feelings of real people across Twitter and assembles them in a new context into unpredictable poetry. Everything is dynamically generated in real time, so what I'm about to read I haven't read before, or even seen. We'll see what we get. I feel hungover but didn't drink at all. I feel some shade energy. I feel liberated. I feel the power of friendship and anime like hooping today. I know who needs to hear it. No, my team won't give this up. I know head is just part of the body, folks in the picture. I know I am the prize and all this, but self-love is becoming too much. I will donate. I will make myself a plush OC at some point. Never get over this song. Get one of these. Will not be 40 years of age and only I have to show is old ass cars and apartment and closet full of Jordan. Man, just imagine that. Thank you for listening. And take a look at Observatory yourself. If you see something you like, send me an email. Yeah, give it up for Logan. A Amsterdam, yeah. Um, all right, next up, we have um, an incredible poet and performer. Um, one of the things I love about this project is that we have people who come from the technology world and the literary world and everything in between. Um, and here we have someone from the first issue who's just incredible. Jason P. Smith, get on up here. Hi, friends. Oh, work. Production. Oh, yeah, I'm not that tall. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you so much to Max and to the HTML review. Uh, if you are a writer or just a person who makes things with text, you should definitely talk to him today. Um, this was a great uh, project to be a part of. Um, and yeah, you're just the shit, and I love you. So thank you. Um, OK, cool. Things that you should know about this poem. Um, it doesn't cool do any cool things on screen, so you know, just watch me. Or you can read it up there. Um, there is a line from Hortense Spillers um, that starts it, and the uh, title is from a Mary, an Amiri Baraka poem. Um, this is Western Hearts at the Edge of Saying. The familiarity of this narrative does nothing to appease the hunger of recorded memory. In a very real sense, every writing as revision makes a discovery all over again. Hortense Spillers. Fool that I am, I indulge apparitions in silence. First brain dutiful to occlusion, stumbling through narrative. Refraction and faux morality stand in as apprentice, or one feels special, refrains, I bought something. Labeled, did you ever think that you would be this rich in negative space? Settled dilemma while strapped for signifiers. Under a formal project, I find decorum. Abstraction is formal. The father is formal. A noun to the slave is formal. What an ornament abandon makes. What a rain hits my window. I take a, throw it back, wreck the tempo. Syllable of feeling. Commercial dignity wasted on want. 
That's the real tea. That's the denouement, refrain. I bought something, gathered a self in the lust of instruction. Fantasy formed in couplets. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Next up, we have Daniel Lickman, who will scoot out. Give it up. <laughs> Hello. Thanks so much for having me, Max. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, so you should know about this poem. All you have to really know is that it was it's kind of a collaboration between myself and GPT-3, the AI text oh, generator. Yeah, yeah, I made it before <laughs> everyone knew about it. And this is, <laughs> some people knew about it. And this is made with an older, slightly older model. It's called Cicada Mountain. A concert is playing far away on the other side of the valley. It's hard to hear it though, because I can just barely detect the sound of a plane approaching from the west. It's so quiet that I can hear it coming from far away. It's getting louder, and it's coming right towards me. It's so loud that it's like it's right on top of me, but there's no sign of it. It's like it's a ghost plane. I hear it circling overhead, and then it's gone as quickly as it came. I can still hear the concert in the distance, but it's getting harder to hear with the plane gone. The plane is gone. It is almost silent but I can just barely hear the concert in the background. In the foreground is a growing din of cicadas. It is no longer silent. In fact, it is very loud. I am sitting in the middle of a cicada concert. The large black eyes on the sides of her head can still, where she, can still see where she is going. She has to be careful not to fall off the mountain. The cicada is one half of an inch long. She has begun the steep hike up the mountain. She has a hard exoskeleton or outer shell that is yellow and black. Cicada is a winged insect. She has a clear pair of wings. When the cicada stops, she rests her wings over her body. The cicada has three pairs of long legs. She has this to say about herself. Quote, my name is J-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-R-
Gadaphagus Argus, Argus Argus, fish was a symbol Christians used to identify each other. Ichdis, an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Argus, each fin, each fish entirely vibrant with gold coloration on its body, some shades being brighter than others, a good active community fish that is often overlooked as a suitable tank mate, a suitable tank mate for many other community species, including clownfish, wrasse, and angles. Difficult breeding, non chlorophis or live Artemia uh, naupli, or infusoria, as a first food, once fry was also an acronym for Jesus Christ, God's son of Savior. Scatophagus was son of Zeus and Niobe, daughter of Phoronius, and was possibly the brother of Pelascus. Zeus was the king of the gods. Niobe was a mortal queen. Phoronius was the first king of Argos. Pelagius was an early Christian theologian. My son, Scatophagus Argos, left me a voicemail on my cell saying there was something wrong with my refund, and if I could call him back, I want to know what is wrong with my refund. <laughs> Last one. A caught tendril of Bryonia diosia. Hanging to a branch below the cribiform plate of my sphenoid in the right temporal lobe, a tendril wraps the sarcophagus. A thick coil encircles her neck. The cribiform plate and a single green stem expands across her mouth. She clutches a stem in both hands as if trying to pry it off with her nails. The tendril then retracted, taking the glass coffin with it. The coffin was placed gently on the ground in front of her. The coffin was a sarcophagus. You are mine, she said. The coffin's glass cover slid open. He lay inside, clothed in a long robe, covered in tendrils. You are mine, she said. I would like to think that that has something to do with us and our connection with nature. The scatophagus sarcophagus. Thank you. Thank you. You're all an amazing audience. Thanks for your patience with all our running around and switching and maybe breaking keyboards. Um, uh, we got a few more, but you're doing great. You're almost there. Um, next, uh, I bet he's he's in the chat. Um, we're gonna ha we're gonna have a a reading from the great Alex Miller. Hi. My name is Alex Miller, and I will be reading an abridged version of my essay called Grid World. When I was a kid, my dad gave me a piece of paper with a grid printed on it. The columns of the grid were labeled with letters, A, B, C, and so on. The rows labeled with numbers, one, two, three, etc. My dad then helped me draw an imaginary island within the grid's boundaries. I sketched the squiggly coastline of my island, forming a splattered blob shape, within which I added the obvious necessary features all mysterious islands require. Forests of crudely drawn trees, a mountain with a cave entrance, an abandoned hut on the beach. My dad showed me how we could use the labeled rows and columns of the grid to address places of interest in our imagined islands. Buried treasure was at square B4, the entrance of the cave was at square C2. We listed out the landmarks next to the map, creating a coordinate-based index. The grid plus index elevated my childlike imaginary treasure island into the grown-up world of official maps and systems, and thereby transformed it into a real, visitable place. An obsession was born. I was intoxicated by graph paper. The emptiness of a totally blank page intimidated me by demanding that I make the first move, but graph paper invited my participation by steering my pencil in the grooves of its strictly regular lines. The grid was like a friend who had already done half the work for me. I drew mazes, maps, patterns, plans, 
all held by the sturdiness of the grid. The effect was soothing. Through the grid's lattice, all my drawings, no matter how primitive, took on an air of rational certainty. In 1982, when designer and artist Susan Kerr was commissioned to design a set of icons for Apple's new Macintosh computer, she bought a small graph paper notebook from a university bookstore and sketched some initial ideas using the cells of the graph paper to represent the pixels of the computer screen. The preserved notebook could not be more humble. It's dirty and beat up and the $2.50 price sticker is still stuck to the backside of the cover. A pixelated rendering of a pointing hand adorns the first page, sketched in thick hot pink marker, with a label scrawled below, paste, as in copy and paste. To me, Care's notebook expresses an optimism about technology by inviting the viewer to participate in the same way that my dad's grid-based map game was an invitation to imagine new worlds. What appears inevitable on the screen is anything but. The graph paper says, you can make your own icons too. I think that if you want to know how something is made, you should look for the grids. They are the ever-present, behind-the-scenes structure of our cities, our machines, our homes, and our lives. You'll find the grid in the artist's studio, in the patterns of the textile weaver's pattern book, in the architect's floor plan sketches, in the engineer's CAD software. The grid can be found throughout history, from ancient Egyptian architectural plans to medieval European embroidery designs. These artifacts trace the practitioner's process along the grid's axial constraints. In 2022, the Museum of Modern Art presented an exhibition on the history of computer game and interaction design, and this exhibition featured Kerr's graph paper notebook. I happened to be in New York and felt I had to go see the infamous artifact in person. The exhibition activated a constellation of memories. My childhood preoccupation with graph paper, the imaginary maps my dad helped me draw, my love for pixelated iconography, the humble graph paper notebook in front of me at the Museum of Modern Art now became the center of this constellation. It was the hub that linked these personal experiences together. Then my grid vision exploded outwards from this center, enveloping everything, and I dreamed that the grid was the understructure to not just my own memories, but to the world. I think we project grids outwards onto the world from within ourselves shining their structure from our minds. We radiate grids. If you are caught in the beam of someone else's grid, as I was in my dad's, the grid's virality will infect you. Its intoxicating pattern will flow through your thoughts and become the architecture of your reality. You will radiate the grid too. Thank you. Yeah, give it up for Alex. All right. Next up, we have Matthew Baker, who is here and and uh, might try to melt this computer down. Give it up for Matthew. I think it, I think it got rid of your terminal. As long as the script is still there. Yeah. I can run in this window. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks to everyone for being here. Uh, my infinite thanks to Max and to Shelby for creating uh, the HTML review and for organizing and hosting this uh, once in a lifetime gathering of superstar cyber artists. Um, my story is called Discrepancies. Uh, it's a story about an American family in 2018, about uh, being an American family in 2018. And it's narrated uh, by all 25 members of the family simultaneously as their conflicting realities converge and diverge. Uh, I only have the one voice. I can't read 25 voices at once, so I wrote a script 
uh, to make a robot read in 25 voices for us. Um, how'd you bring up the terminal? Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hello, world. We were all there that day at the farm, gathered around the table in the kitchen, arguing as usual about the temperature in the house, which was unbearably hot, and about which channel to switch to on the television, and about which station to turn to on the radio, and about whether or not phones should be allowed at the table. Forks clinked against plates. Spoons scraped against bowls. Wisps of steam rose from platters of food. We had always been a growing family, but over the past few years tensions had been rising between us, a vicious enmity, and that night at the farm there was a feeling that maybe we'd have to kill each other before the meal was through. Glancing around the table warily, we eyed each other as we chewed. All of us had contributed to the feast spread across the table. The turkey, a, a delicious and juicy creature made emotions to a fatty crisp. and a unique personality whose throat had been slit with a knife, mashed potatoes that had been made with olive oil instead of milk and butter, a, a surprisingly tasty recipe that had the wonderful bonus quality of not including ingredients that had been reaped by groping the teats of enslaved cattle. Gravy that! Had been oh, feeded in a microwave, to be perfectly safe for human consumption. Corn that had been genetically modified, which was tolerant and containing the genes of whoever to be perfectly safe for human consumption. Yams that were probably ingested with scrubs that had to be grown organic. A stuffing that had been ruined with too much salt. A cranberry relish that, among other ingredients, contained city tap water. Which was labeled as a substitute for human consumption. Out in the Illagor, twilight beyond the windows, a herd of deer that had just created a simulation evolution, or grazing for grain among the brittle stubbles of wheat in the field, breathing clouds of steam over the frosted dirt, and then headlights of a car appeared in the distance, and together the deer looked and froze and then bounded off toward the woods, silhouettes vanishing into the dusk. The headlights shimmered and brightened and expanded and then abruptly disappeared as the car sped past the farm, burning petroleum, contributing incrementally to the total rise of carbon dioxide that was rapidly naturally occurring in the atmosphere of the planet. Contrails were streaked across the sky. The country, glowing brightly on the screen of the alarmingly old television, shimmering in the family room. A newscaster was delivering a report about the experience of the staff at an embassy in the tropics. Jazz was playing over the radio on the counter. Pierce cracked a bitter joke about the climate change. Interesting. Dipping a roll into some gravy, shaking pepper onto a dollop of mashed potatoes, Eleanor made an inflammatory remark about the tragical shadow government that supposedly controlled the country, and then she reached for a knife. Madison glanced down as her phone buzzed with a news notification in the pouch of her hoodie. Carter glanced down at the pocket on his Oxford as his phone lit with a news notification. Nancy glanced over at the wall as her phone chirped in a purse hanging from the hooks by the door. Bill bent his head to eat a bite of the string bean casserole that everybody loved. loved. Grant drank a sip of grapefruit juice, sitting at an empty plate, still, untasting his and imaginary toxins by fasting. Hannah drank a sip of cream soda, still wearing the necklace with the crystal, which showed no effect on human health whatsoever aside from the placebo benefits for gullible naturopaths. Zach drank a sip of root beer, 
wearing the commemorative sticker on his t-shirt announcing that he'd recently received the flu vaccine. Approximately as risky as taking a couple of aspirin, Florence drank a sip of ginger ale, still wearing a necklace with the crucifix. Xavier drank a sip of cherry cola, wearing an aloha shirt with some smokable cans. I'll stop them there, and I promise never to do that again. That was amazing. Um, all right, next we have, I keep consulting my list because it's quite the list. Um, we have all the way from Melbourne, Australia, um, a reading from Nathan Mifsud. So give it up for Nathan. G'day folks in New York, this is Nathan Mifsud. I made the piece called Sun Letters in issue two of the HTML review. I'm speaking from Wurundjeri country in Nam, also known as Melbourne. I was hoping that I'd be speaking outdoors because, you know, sunlight is kind of related to my piece, but uh, it's very cold and windy today, so I'm not. Um, now, the piece that I made is an essay. Um, it's on language and Maltese history and culture, and I present it in an interactive clock face um, where different fragments are available depending on the time in the viewer's location. So if you're watching this live and you're in New York, uh, I think it's like right before sunset. So the whole piece is available in that golden hour. But after that, um, once the sun goes down, it's just a blank clock face and the sound of crickets. If people jump on the page only then, uh, they might <laughs> never come back because they don't realize there's something to read, uh, which I find kind of funny. Um, I kind of like that it's not always on. It reminds us that the virtual world is rooted in the physical world. Um, and, you know, a little bit of difficulty and obscurity is part and parcel of the handmade web, which I think is a very expressive and anti-commercial place. Um, in, the clock itself uses Maltese letters instead of numbers. And this is just an extension of me being interested in different ways of measuring, um, measuring time and thinking about time from Aboriginal uh, non-linearity to Italian six hour clocks, to the moon cycle, to the deep time of geology, all this stuff fascinates me. Um, I was also inspired by a novel called The Yield by Tara June Winch, um, focused on the Wiradjuri language. Um, both that novel and my piece try to bring awareness to a language that is dissolving in the diaspora. And more generally, you can think of the piece as just me reconnecting with my cultural heritage and hoping to share it with all of you. So um, I'll read the, the first letter to give you a sense of what it's about. Each sunrise suffuses agony and ecstasy alike. Bodies glow, oceans sparkle. The sun speaks the same fiery tongue as ever. By contrast, language is many-tongued, ever-constructed, in constant advance and retreat. Each sentence is a swell of voices, a tide of generations. In Maltese, the sun is a shemsh. The initial consonant of the noun shemsh warps the definite article il into ish, blurring the sounds together. Not all consonants have this effect. Notice that il kama, the moon, preserves the il, which is the equivalent of al in Arabic. Accordingly, we call nine consonants the sun letters of the alphabet and the rest moon letters. How fitting for a language spoken by sun-drenched islanders, the moon with its tides caressing the shores. Alas, I only know a smattering of Maltese, much like the islands themselves, limestone smears in the sea between Sicily and Africa, their position making them in a crossroads of kingdoms, whose every tussle ossified in the lingual substrate. Soon after moving to Melbourne several years ago, I learned there was a Maltese community centre near me. I cycled over. It was a modest brick building attached to a chapel. At the entrance stood a compact man twice my age, waiting, he said, for the bingo session to end so that he could mop the hall. I told him I was there to enrol in language classes. Are you Maltese, he asked. I was born in Australia. Your parents? Grandparents, I said. 50-50 then, you're a skip. All of them were born in Malta, I said. Get your relatives to teach you, he said. I wandered the building. The hall had a stained glass depiction of Valletta's Grand Harbour, which I imagine some bingo players had last seen in person, clutching their parents' hands on the deck of a departing ship in the decade following World War II. Back on the patio, Joe still stood smoking. 
Need some prickly pear, I said, pointing to the garden beds. You like prickly pear, eh? I described a bend of the creek where I had found Baitar Tashoik, a ubiquitous site on the Maltese Islands, flowing over corrugated fences to invade the banks. Turned out he lived in the area, fed ducks every morning. Some of those road cacti could have been his. A dozen of us began that language course, all connected to Malta by blood or marriage. I abandoned it after a few months, perhaps having already spent thousands of hours studying Chinese characters and German grammar, only for that knowledge to erode, like arches reclaimed by the sea, I recognised the limits of my linguistic dedication. Still, I kept the books. Now and then, I leaf through the dictionary. Dabbling in the language of my ancestors is like splashing in the water that bore them to foreign shores. I couldn't use pastizzi or fatira in a Maltese conversation, but I know their taste. Let's savour some words together. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you to Max and Shelby for putting together something so wonderful. And thank you to everyone um, keeping the internet a fun place. Ciao. Thanks, Nathan. All right, next up we have, right from the front row, Andy Wallace. Thank you. Hello. Right, let me find this here. Uh, so I'm going to be showing a nonlinear text explorer called Intimate Codex. Uh, I really want to thank Max for um, giving me a reason to bring this to the web. This was a C++ project from, I think, 2016, 2015, something in there. Um, but it's a nice thing to have on the web, so I was very happy to be able to do it. So like a lot of the things we saw tonight, um, this is I didn't write the text in this myself. Um, it was done in collaboration with a bunch of these older authors most of whom are dead, I think, uh, certainly most of them. So what this does is it's a little website that takes in a lot of text files, just plain text, uh, and then it breaks it up based on carriage returns into individual passages. And it likes having a lot of text, so I put uh, six books in here. And if you play with this at home, you can actually put your own text in if you want. You can clear out what's there, just drag in text files, just make sure they're beefy. So let's go ahead and start. Oh, that's really loud. We can maybe turn it down a little bit. All right. Is that seemly? At the same time, he seized the youngest by the hand in order to pull her away. But as soon as he touched her, he likewise stuck fast and was himself obliged to run behind. The servant at once seized her by the neck, carried her to the kitchen, and said to the cook, Here is a fine duck. Pray, kill her. Got a rough one right out of the gate. Uh, but the bird set up such a loud scream that all the soldiers awoke, and they took him prisoner and carried him before the king. Then the gold was brought up and the wedding celebrated. But howsoever much the young king loved his wife and however happy he was, he still said always, if I could but shudder, if I could but shudder. When anything had to be done, it was always the elder who was forced to do it. But if his father bade him fetch anything when it was late or in the nighttime and the way led through the churchyard or any other dismal place, he answered, Oh no, father, I'll not go there. It makes me shudder. So to just quickly explain kind of how this works, uh, if it wasn't clear, uh, you see a word on screen and the words that have more connections to other passages are just a little more vibrant. They kind of have a little groove to them. Uh, and so you can type one of those words in. Uh, can I type one in? Uh, and it will highlight, and what it will do is it will just grab another passage that has that same word. There's no further computation than that. It's just keywords and randomness. But it, it sort of allows different passages and totally different works to be linked together, not so much in a narrative structure, but sort of allows um, sometimes surprising emotional kind of through lines to go through it. Uh, I made this for a friend's party, I think, yeah, in 2015. Uh, and the party was about two days, different kind of interactive things. Uh, and I was very, very pleased. I woke up one morning, I think the second morning, and I found two people who had been passing a keyboard back and forth, I think for about five hours at that point. And I dearly hope they got some sleep later, but it, it kind of warmed my heart to see. So yeah, thank you so much for allowing me to present this. Right. Go back here.
here. Next up, we have over here, Maylee, um, a dear friend of ours. Here's um, Maylee with uh, a reading of her amazing Wordle poem. Hi, everybody. I'm Maylee Ku. Thanks so much for having me here today, Max and Shelby, at the very first HTML review reading. I'm um, such an honor to be here with you all and all of the other contributors. Such great company to be in. Um, and I just want to mention how grateful I am to you for creating this space um, for those of us who love to play at the intersection of bits and words. Um, such an amazing thing to have a home, a place to publish this. Um, so thank you. Uh, let me talk a little bit about this poem I'm going to read today. It's called Guess Words. And um, some of you might remember this moment in time at the beginning of last year uh, that this little game called Wordle sort of took things by storm. It went from just a couple hundred users to millions in a very short span of time. Um, and that was happening at the same time that we were experiencing wave X of pandemic. So as I was playing this game, I noticed uh, that I was starting to have much more interest in creating poetry every time I was guessing rather than actually trying to win the game uh, day over day. And that was sort of the start of this. Um, it became what you're going to hear today. And, uh, and after creating it and um, realizing the importance of the format um, and the significance of like the visual interface of Wordle, I realized um, it was gonna be pretty hard to find a place to put it. And I wound up just throwing it up on the web, um, not being sure what was going to happen. And, um, it was a wonderful surprise to hear from Max and to hear um, shout out to the Anna magazine and to hear um, when somebody pointed out to me that uh, the New Yorker recommends newsletter had actually pointed directly to my website as well. Um, so all that to say, you never know where this stuff's gonna wind up sometimes when you put it up and now we actually have a place to put it. So again, thank you for having me. And um, this is Guess Words. Banal Beige Month, Board Crowd, Guess Words. Share their shape, paste their forms. Small vivid green cheer below dingy taupe cloud skies. Eager other tries. While tears cover globe, earth fires erupt, tides risen, walls built, lives faded. Panic, siege, break, fight, drive, amber alert, smoke blunt, twill beers, clock hours, drink punch. Crimp hopes, crack stone, cheat death. Pause, tired, wrong, leave, slump, sleep. Wince twice, quite quiet ahead, dread. After, later, maybe amend hopes. Cling, chant, faith, bring tiger, start fresh, plant seeds, touch grass, renew month, mount dream aloft, blink, maybe light again. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. In case you're curious, uh, the text that appears in green are, are actual words that at the time of writing the poem had already been wordle words. Um, 
I'm sure many more of them have become portal words since then. But, um, but yeah, that was the moment in time. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your night, y'all. Amazing. All right, we have three more. And uh, we're getting, we, we went like pseudo alphabetically, so now we know we're getting to the end. Um, next we have Catherine Yang, who is the reason this happened. Um, when we were meeting uh, our editorial meetings, Catherine was like, you have to have an event. And I was like, oh, a few events, like in different locations. And Catherine was like, no, w one with everybody going all at once. And so um, Catherine should get all the credit. So um, give it up for Catherine. Um, thanks everyone so much for having me. Thanks for, uh, to Max and Shelby for um, putting this uh, incredible online space together and for organizing this event. And thank you to Culture Hub and La Mama for having us here tonight. Um, my piece in the HTML review is sort of a couple of explorations of um, a tool that I've been putting together um, for creating these sorts of um, sliding puzzle poems. Um, and these are sort of forms that I've been playing with, um, with the intention of having a form that can hold multiple truths, that can hold secrets, and that can hold echoes. So I have four little fragments to read through, um, and hopefully uh, you, uh, it sort of makes sense together. So part one, this is my This is my, your, our, lovely, little, cool, weird, poem, story, tool, toy, for this moment, for carrying in the pocket, for propping up on the mantelpiece. This is a tool for exploring alternate words, for exploring alternate worlds. This is a poem for making interactive poems. This is a poem for making sliding puzzles. This is a poem for making up your mind or not. A poem can live so many lives. Show us how it once was, how it could have been, how it still be, could still be, how it has always been, and how it will always be. And part two. The form that um, this sort of like uh, syntax is based on is uh, regular expressions, um, which for those of you who are familiar with them um, is sort of ver a very ugly, um, uh, deceptively, um, it's sort of like a very powerful tool, but um, can get very thorny very, very quickly. Um, but just to explain for those of you who are not familiar with them, a regular expression is a text pattern that uses operators to capture a range of possible strings. So the pipe operator, which is that vertical bar, matches um, the either the previous or the preceding token, so it acts as sort of like an or operator, and the parentheses groups those two things together. Another use, uh, there's a paper that I read once that has sort of um, informed um, almost all of my work since I've read it and I've been trying to sort of embody what the author has written since I've read that paper. Um, and it's a paper by this person called Dan Weber called Regular Expressions as a System of Poetic Notation. In this paper, he writes about the pote poetic potential of regular expressions. He describes the potential of regex to be a system of notation to augment, to build upon, to multiply the possibilities of language to make nets for catching truth. He writes, when reading about regular expressions, 
substitute the word means wherever the word matches occurs and the text will become about phoetics. Part three. Hypothetically, what if we fell in love? Dearest, I said and held till death. Hypothetically, dearest, what if I said we fell and held in love till death? Dearest, I said, we fell in love. Hypothetically, I said, and held till death, etc. Part four. This is the final piece um, that uh, is a piece that I've been exploring a little bit lately, um, taking it out of um, this sort of like basic visual form into more of an interactive um, experimental spatial form. So the piece originally reads, good morning, I love you. I think I'll be doing some art today. Let me make the coffee. This life is composed of new springs. Good morning, I love you. Good love, good you. I think I'll be doing some art today. I let this life the art. Mm, the dangers of live reading. I just, I just like to share that one more time since it moved a little quickly. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of um, sort of a revealing effect that goes that uh, appears as you scroll down the page. Okay, those are my four parts. Um, thank you so much for listening, and thank you for having me. All right. Next up, we have. All the way from, I think, also Seattle, Washington, Ivan Zhao. Hey, everyone. My name is Ivan. And yeah, thanks so much to Max and Shelby for hosting this event. I'm very sad that I couldn't be there in person, um, but I hope everyone's enjoying it and that it's a fantastic time all around and that the space is really nice. Um, yeah, so because I can't be in there in person and because my piece is also a little weird to read, I just wanted to make a quick video to talk about like process and inspiration and hope that like gives some clarity into some of the stuff that I'm thinking about. And maybe if that's of interest, would also love to chat and collaborate on things. Um, but yeah, my piece is called A World of Space. Um, it's loosely based off a couple of things. Some of the things I was inspired by are uh, Undertale, of course, the font choice itself is really similar. The text, uh, the dialogue sound itself is also really similar. I was also really interested in building a project on top of Twinery, uh, which is a interactive fiction based tool editor on the web that allows like artists and non-technical folks who um, may not be familiar with game engines to build on top of the web in sort of a graph based building system. And that in itself is super exciting. But one of the issues that I personally had with it was I wanted to kind of like craft and create the sort of look and feel that it would give and also be able to make sound changes and edit and create the soundscape. And so those were some of the inspirations in getting started. But the other thing I was thinking a lot about was the creation of the web itself, like the browser as a medium for artistic movements, for hosting, what it means to exist on the browser, what it means to exist on the internet and how are my personal emotions. And one of the things that I was thinking about at the time was just being very 
almost like sad or like depressed or thinking about just like the limitless space that exists on the internet and also I was thinking a lot about like old chat rooms like omegle and like those kinds of things where you literally just like meet someone random on the internet and so that's kind of like where this piece was born and once again yeah thanks max for helping with a lot of the editing and getting it to the state of where it was um but it's yeah an interactive fiction piece where you play as basically yourself um in this browser you're plopped into this like location on the internet um technically like it's i love things that are sort of like meta or like kind of break a nod to the fourth wall where it's like part of the joke is that like oh like you don't know how you got to this location but it's like the only way to navigate here is through a specific url and like that in itself is like a sort of self nod which i always think is really fun um and some like yeah i think it follows a lot of like linear storytelling one of the things that I was also really interested on the web is this idea of digital agency and the fact that in like interactive fiction pieces, I think that one of the things that you consider or in like games of the self is that like there's this balance between how many permutations you can create and still have a cohesive narrative. Um, some of the things that I was thinking about during this was like, for, for example, the game Hades has, I think, 140,000 words lines of dialogue okay anyway it, like not 100 percent sure but it has a lot of dialogue to consider and i kind of almost wanted to play with this idea where i feel like interactive fiction pieces are known for where known for playing around with the fact that you can have choices and like you have a lot of agency but also i think that one of the things about the web is that you almost don't have a lot of agency like a lot of things are dictated by you know the market or like the attention and like i was thinking a lot about the attention economy and how most of the places that we spend on the internet are controlled around like certain spots or locations and thinking about all those things and so the piece in itself is kind of a subversion of that as well but yeah hope i highly recommend i feel like this is one of those things where i'm like it's kind of like selfish and like a little pretentious to say where it's like oh you should like play it and experience it for yourself and like hopefully you enjoy it um i love making work that makes people feel things, um, is what I, what I like to say, but yeah, like, go play it, I, like, there's kind of a twist, um, as, like, sort of a spoiler, if you haven't already played it, um, and, like, things just, like, consider about, like, I don't know, the liminal space of the internet, as people would say, and yeah, thanks again for the time, and hope the rest of the evening goes well. All right. Um, and unless I forgot someone, I think we're about to have our, our last reader. So thanks, all of you. I know it's a long time to sit. So if you want to start the swap, Nick, I'll, I'll say a couple things uh, before introducing you. Um, first, I want to say um, to everyone who showed up, uh, if I don't know you, uh, come say hi. If you, I would love to get to know you and your work. And um, we take submissions. Uh, every fall and publish every spring. So um, please, please, please submit something. Say hi. We're very friendly. Um, I know we've mentioned her a lot. I also just want to say like Shelby, who my co-collaborator is just like the greatest and um, her designs are incredible and, and she's just everything um, about this. And lastly, um, uh, there have been three installations that um, for people who couldn't make it tonight. There was Everest Pipkin's piece in the lobby, Esther Bouquet's piece in the in the lounge, and then once it's over, we're going to pull this curtain back. And Spencer Chang has an installation on a patio, which is of an HTML garden. So after it's over, you can hang out and explore this new space for a little. But uh, I think we're almost there for. Um, Another person who just, this wouldn't exist without their, dare I say, decades of work. Um, uh, not quite. Not quite. <laughs> um, years of work. Um, give it up for Nick Montfort. All right. Max, Shelby, thank you so much. Um, Oh, just one more piece. I want to thank Culture Hub, my fellow readers, all of you for coming out. Um, and thank you for your patience, because this does take a little while to load. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Ah. No. Don't actually have to do that. Um. Oh, no, no. I see. Let's do it this way. I've got special access to a website called localhost. Stop that. Okay, I'm gonna, first of all, what I'll do is, uh-huh, uh okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Okay, here we go. Hobble, 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 coil of rope. Alpha, beta, gamma, delta, digamma, zeta, eta, theta, iota, alpha, iota, beta, iota, gamma, iota, delta, iota, digamma, tap a keg of brew, I felt a thigh, <coughs> aleph, bet, gimel, valeth, hey. You have to be careful here because if you write these in a naive way, you end up with some of the names of God. But this program doesn't even store them in memory, much less put them on the screen. I, 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 I. I-V, V, V-I. There's actually a zero in Roman numerals in, but it wasn't invented until about 850 CE. So I guess the Roman school children got an I when they didn't turn in any work. <sighs> I don't know how to pronounce uh, Mayan numerals, but uh, isn't it remarkable that the Mayans developed the zero before it was used in India, then Africa, then Europe, we just tend to forget about this because there was no contact between civilizations before that zero of a light bulb went off in Eurasia. Fortunately, I have uh, lots of time to remind you of this because the Mayans used a base 60 or sexagesimal system, which was very good for calendrical purposes. <laughs> Rei, Ichi, Ni, San, Shi, Go, Roko, Shishi, Hachi. The Japanese, of course, ripped off their number system from the Chinese. Imagine that. So I've decided to repay them by mispronouncing their version of the numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty-seven, sixty-five, seventy-eight. A hundred! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 18, B, teen, C, teen, D, teen, E, teen, F, teen, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 20, A, 20, B, 60, F, 70, C, 80, C, 80, A, BDB, CDF, DDB, EDA. Progress. Thank you. Yay. Thanks so much, everybody. I didn't forget anyone, right? <laughs> All right, we're going to, yeah, reveal. Oh. So, um, yeah, come hang, say hi. Thanks so much, everyone, really. This was amazing and a dream come true. And
Yeah, it's tough. Bye, everyone. Well, yeah, stick around, hang out. There's more wine. You can come see this piece. Talk to Max, talk to us. Thank you so much. Bathrooms and there are chips. I'll bring you chips. <laughs>